2017 Peugeot 308 d review. Like the rest of the range, the Peugeot 308 d gets a mild makeover and improved infotainment, but the oily bits are unchanged. What is it? The Peugeot 308 d has got to that time in its life where a trip to the cosmetic surgeon is in order. There's a new bonnet, grill and lights outside, while inside there's a crisper display for the infotainment system. Unlike the regular 308, there are no mechanical changes or new engines. That means you get the same turbocharged 1.6-liter motor with 266 bhp that originally came from the RCZR. It drives through a 6-speed manual gearbox to a torsion limited slip differential that sits between the front wheels. As before, there's also an 11mm drop in ride height compared with regular 308s, more negative camber and Michelin Pilot Super Sport tires. Braking is taken care of by 380mm Ilcon front discs with Peugeot Sport branding. What's it like? You wouldn't expect a few nips and tucks to make any difference to the way the car drives, and they don't. Although we were unable to drive the 308 d on the road, it felt identical to the version we ran as a long-termer. Although it's 400cc down on the majority of mid-sized hot hatches, the 308 d s engine feels strong and has a pleasingly linear power delivery. It won't rev like the Honda Civic Type R's 2.0-liter turbo unit, and the augmentation of the sound isn't particularly convincing, but it's certainly an effective engine. Grip levels are high, thanks to those Pilot Super Sports, but they do highlight a chassis that's a bit too soft for really hard track work. You certainly feel the diff pulling the nose of the car towards the apex under power, but it too could be harder in operation. The balance of the car is predominantly nose-led, but a lift will tuck the front in. Really bung it into a corner and you'll find the tail edges around but is easily caught once you're back on the power. If only Peugeot had taken the opportunity to retune the two things that really let the d down, the steering and gearbox. Due to the high-mounted instrument cluster, i-cockpit in Peugeot speak, the wheel is tiny and connected to a very quick rack. While it means little wheel twirling is needed, the steering can feel hyperactive at times and transmits precious little feedback from the front tires. As for the gearbox, the ratios are well chosen, but the shift quality is vague and not at all satisfying. To be honest, though, the track is not the best place for the 308T. No. It's much better thought of as a rapid but relatively sensible hatchback in the mold of the Volkswagen Golf GTI. Here you can appreciate the reasonable fuel economy, a ride that is more comfortable than more hardcore rivals and agreeable CO2 emissions. We've already touched on the interior, where you'll find that iCockpit either works for you or doesn't. Some might find the wheel obstructing the instruments when it's set to your preferred position but the layout will be fine for others. As for interior quality, there's a good spread of soft-touch plastics, and the nap leather on the steering wheel and door pulls looks and feels classy. There are enough specific touches to distinguish it from regular 308s, including supportive sports seats, red highlights and a few T logos. As for the new infotainment system, it does look marginally crisper but still frustrates in other ways. Some of the icons are a bit small, but the main issue is that the screen controls almost everything. That means delving into the menus to adjust the air conditioning, for example, sometimes buttons are just better. Better. Ford Shelby Mustang GT 350R 2017 Review Ford has tried to turn the Mustang into a track machine by putting it on a diet and giving it a new engine. Has it worked? What is it? To put it politely, the Ford Mustang GT isn't the first car you'd choose to develop into a stripped-out, no-compromise track machine. For one thing it's a sizable old bus, it's 30 centimeters longer than the Porsche 911, 
a rather more obvious candidate, and some 10 centimeters wider, and for another, it weighs the better part of 1,800 kilograms. There wasn't a great deal Ford Performance could do about the Mustang's size, but to give the Shelby GT 350R a fighting chance on track, it ditched the rear seats, stereo, sat nav and air conditioning, although the latter three items can be added back in optionally. The wheels are exotic carbon fiber items, too, saving 6 kilograms at each corner. The total weight loss over the 5.0 GT is 60 kilograms, which is useful if not exactly transformative. The entire chassis has been overhauled with upgraded components and a much more track-focused setup, while a comprehensive aerodynamic package promises much more downforce than the regular car. Most unusually, though, the warbling V8 engine that powers the conventional Mustang has been ditched for a higher revving 5.2-liter flat-plane crank V8. That's something of a departure for an American muscle car, flat-plane cranks and higher revving V8s have been the preserve of European sports cars until now. The new motor revs beyond 8,000 revolutions per minute, whereas the outgoing crossplane V8 doesn't reach far beyond 6,500 revolutions per minute. The power and torque figures hint at a rev V8 rather than a lazy, torque rich bruiser, 2, 526 bhp at 7,500 revolutions per minute and 429 pounds foot at 4,750 revolutions per minute are not typical Mustang numbers. The soundtrack isn't typical Mustang either, the rumbling score replaced by highly strung snarls and barks. What's it like? As the most extreme Mustang to date, the GT 350R goes to lengths not even the GT 350 model would have considered in the pursuit of racetrack performance. In fact, Ford says it didn't even concern itself with trying to make the GT 350R work on the public road. The standard car's plush leather chairs have been swapped out for heavily bolstered regress, while the steering wheel is wrapped in Olcantara. The sports seats are actually set an inch or two lower than the standard items, and with the steering column at full extension, the seating position is just about perfect. If Ford wants the GT 350R to be assessed as a track car, there are few better places to do just that than Thruxton. The UK's fastest race track is a stern test of car and driver, mixing ballsy high-speed sequences with tight and technical sections. The GT 350R is more than up to it. Whereas the Mustang GT feels about as adept on circuit as a canal boat would, this stripped out model feels right at home. That much more aggressive suspension setup takes away all of the wallow and floatiness of the standard car, replacing it with agility, control, and precision. There are sections of Thruxton that demand so many different things from a car all at once the start of the lap. For instance, combines a fast left-hand bend with a sharp crest and a heavy braking zone. Many cars would be completely flummoxed by that sequence, but the GT 350R swallows it up without any trouble whatsoever. The steering is ultra-sharp and direct, the big Brembo brakes are excellent and the fat Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires generate enormous grip and traction. In the high-speed sections, such as the intimidatingly fast church corner, the car is incredibly stable, thanks in part to the aero package. There's so little body roll or dive under braking that you quickly forget just how big and, let's be honest, heavy the GT 350R is. Chasing an 8,000 revolutions per minute redline in a Mustang is a novel experience. The Zingy V8 is right at the heart of the driving experience and it flings the car along at a mighty rate. It's also so much more responsive than the GT's cross-plane V8, it takes only a quick stab of the accelerator to bring the revs up during a downshift, whereas you really have to get into the GT's throttle pedal to awaken the engine, the engine.